Welcome to the Indonesia launch of World, uh, Human Rights Watch's World Report. Uh, my name is Philem Kine. I'm the Deputy Director of Asia Division. I'm based in New York, but I come to Indonesia as much as possible uh, to spend time and support my colleague uh, Andreas Harsono to my left. Um, I want to be as brief as possible because I would like to open this up to questions and discussion as much as possible. Um, this is a really uh, interesting time in Indonesia with regards to human rights. Um, there are a lot of things going on, uh, some of them good, a lot of them bad. And the fact that we have a new government of President Joko Widodo uh, is a really unique opportunity to turn the page on what we at Human Rights Watch have documented as a, uh, a very uh, difficult 10-year uh, regression in many key human rights indicators in Indonesia under former President uh, Esbaye. But uh, I want to start by giving credit where credit is due. And the fact is, is that over the past year, there actually have been some improvements and some uh, advances in human rights in, in Indonesia that need to be recognized. And the first one is that uh, I'd like to note that the Indonesian government in July of 2014 passed a mental health law, which is a, an important step toward addressing what is really a, a silent and uh, underreported mental health crisis in this country. Uh, this mental health law is not perfect. Uh, but it's definitely a step in the right direction. Another issue I want to note is that uh, President Widodo himself, during his election campaign, uh, committed publicly to investigating uh, specific instances of disappearances uh, in 1998. Um, this is a, an important and symbolic step toward addressing uh, what has been decades of severe impunity for disappearances, extrajudicial killings, and other abuses by Indonesia's security forces. Uh, President Widodo has made the commitment to investigate it, uh, investigate these disappearances. We have yet to hear a precise plan and a precise timeline, uh, but it's still early days. Uh, the other issue that's worth mentioning, and this is related to uh, what I just mentioned, is that over the past year, uh, there has been an, a loosening on the decades-long taboo about discussion and reporting on the 1965-1966 uh, mass killings in Indonesia. Uh, Human Rights Watch uh, has uh, publicly advocated with the uh, Indonesian government to uh, open up uh, its files to allow full disclosure and transparency about those years and about those mass killings. Uh, we're a long way from getting to that point, but the fact that this topic, which used to be completely taboo, is now something that more people are feel more comfortable about discussing, not least because of Joshua Oppenheimer's groundbreaking uh, documentaries, the act of killing, and the follow-up, the look of silence, uh, which are widely available, I believe, through download here in Indonesia. So it's a step in the right direction. And the final uh, nod of recognition for improvement is that early in 2014, the Indonesian government signed an agreement with the government of Saudi Arabia uh, to help protect the rights of the many thousands of migrant workers from Indonesia who go to work in Saudi Arabia. Having said that, Indonesia's human rights challenges are considerable, and President Widodo is inheriting a legacy of worsening sectarian uh, violence and intimidation against religious uh, minorities. Um, there is ongoing security forces impunity, particularly in Papua. And we are also seeing a very worrying regression in women's rights in Indonesia. We see in Indonesia, and we have documented uh, in this report, which we released uh, last year, that religious minorities in Indonesia are increasingly under attack. Uh, they are under attack from uh, militant Islamists, 
who uh, have a strong uh, sentiment of intolerance that lends itself to violence. The targets are the Ahmadiyya, Shia, uh, certain Christian communities. And uh, adding insult to injury, of course, is that elements of the Indonesian government and the Indonesian security forces uh, are frequently uh, passively or actively complicit in the harassment, intimidation, and violence against religious minorities in Indonesia. This is a key issue that the government must confront sooner rather than later. Uh, President uh, Yudhoyono absolutely failed to address this issue, so it now lands in the inbox of President Widodo. The other issue I want to mention that's related to that is we have noted how uh, Sharia law in Aceh has serious implications for human rights. We saw uh, late last year that the uh, Aceh provincial government passed two bylaws that outlawed uh, same-sex relations as well as any sexual relations outside of marriage. The punishment for those transgressions being uh, up to 100 lashes as law, uh, along with fines and imprisonment. Uh, these developments are seriously worrying in terms of uh, the implications for the human rights environment uh, for uh, the people of Aceh. And this is something that we are continuing to engage with the Indonesian government on. Final issue I want to talk about really quickly is the issue of women's rights. Um, I think probably the most emblematic uh, indicator of the regression in women's rights in Indonesia and the government's tolerance of attacks on women's rights in Indonesia is the fact that uh, both police and the military require female applicants to those institutions to submit to quote unquote virginity tests. Uh, these virginity tests are violence against women by another name. They are junk science, they are unnecessary, they are abusive. Uh, virginity tests of any kind have been uh, the World Health Organization has demanded that they uh, stop. And the Indonesian government has failed to respond to Human Rights Watch's research and advocacy on this issue to instruct the police to stop uh, requiring women to undergo these abusive virginity tests and to require the military to stop uh, these, abusive military, uh, these abusive virginity tests. I should add that the military requires female applicants to undergo virginity tests, as well as the wives of officers in the military. So this is a, uh, this is a problem that affects thousands of women, and it's been going on for decades. Um, very quickly, I just want to address two issues that uh, are kind of breaking news in Indonesia. The first is re regarding uh, corruption and the current situation facing uh, the, corru the Corruption Eradication Commission, KPK. Uh, corruption has very corrosive knock-on effects that can have a uh, serious impact on human rights. Uh, human Rights Watch has done research that indicated in 2011, just one year, uh, corruption and mismanagement in the forestry department, forestry industry in Indonesia cost the government two billion dollars. That was one year and one part of this country and this country's bureaucracy. Um, we estimate that that amount of money, two billion dollars, could have doubled the Ministry of Health's annual budget, which would have had profoundly positive implications for the health rights of Indonesians. Uh, we also note that corruption encourages uh, rent-seeking behavior by the security forces that encourage them to be passively or actively uh, complicit in human rights abuses. So when we look at corruption in Indonesia, our view very strongly is that Indonesia desperately needs a strong uh, corruption eradication mechanism and that corruption eradication mechanism needs to be supported, funded, resourced, and protected by the government so it can do its job. Human Rights Watch has been extremely disappointed by the government of President Joko Widodo's decision to uh, 
begin uh, a series of executions of drug traffickers. The death penalty is something that is inherently cruel, barbaric, unacceptable. Um, it's irreversible. Human Rights Watch absolutely opposes it, and we feel that the government of Indonesia has made a serious mistake by informing or pitching to the public that executing drug traffickers is a deterrent to crime because all studies indicate that the death penalty is not a deterrent. It's also worth noting that the United Nations Office of Drugs and Crime in 2010 called for an end to the death penalty for all drug-related crimes. So our view is that by re-implementing the death penalty for drug tra for, uh, here in Indonesia, um, the Indonesian government is on the wrong side of history. Uh, it's operating uh, with, with a mistaken assessment of the facts, and it really should join the global tide toward abolition of the death penalty rather than mass executions. That's all I have to say. I'd like to turn it over to you. Any questions you might have? Thank you. Josh Dyer from the Jakarta Post. Um, just wondering, just on the executions and the death penalty, um, what do you think it will take for the death penalty to be abolished? And how much do you think international pressure could play a part in that? Or is this going to be purely um, a reform that would come as a result of a change in domestic opinion? We talked with the Minister of Law and Human Rights. Yasona Lauli, as well as his Director General on Human Rights. His name is Aidir Amin Daud. And we, Philip and I, basically asked them that kind of questions. What should be taken to stop that penalty in Indonesia? And they say that, theoretically, it needs the parliament uh, approval, the parliamentarian approval. As long as the law is there, as long as that penalty is on the book, there is no way that it is not going to be used by, by you know, any police, any, any prosecutor, or any judge, or of course, any president. <coughs> and then we asked them what should be done to get the parliamentarian approval. And they say the procedural code, the procedural code has to be revised. There is some article which says that there are death penalty in Indonesia. So that is what they are trying to do. They are trying to revise the procedural code to delete that particular article. Uh, for, for your information, there are more than 360, 360 Indonesian citizens overseas, mostly migrant workers, are on death rows. More than 20 are on the final stages, mostly in the Gulf, in the Gulf countries, Saudi Arabia included, and also in Malaysia. Uh, 16 of them in Malaysia are Achenis on death rows. 16 of them are Achenis. I know there are some Achenis in this room. So 16 Achenis are on death rows. According to Migrant Care, an organization which advocates for Indonesian migrant workers overseas, the Jokowi administration decision to do that execution is, quote, holding those Indonesian citizen hostages to their own policy. Uh, welcome, Pak Marzuki Tarusman. Pak Marzuki is also a former human rights, uh, Komnas Ham Secretary General. So uh, that, that is what it takes for the government, for the parliament to erase that penalty. It need a parliamentary approval. Uh, and Josh, I would just add that in the short term, uh, here's what the government can and should do. Number one, it can and should reimpose the unofficial moratorium on the death penalty. Okay, that's something it can do tomorrow. And, you know, the President Joko Widodo is a person with a reputation for operating on the facts. He's, some, he's a technocrat. He's somebody who uh, evaluates things based on, on the facts and evidence. And he can take that time during the moratorium to look carefully at uh, research about the death penalty and about deterrence and come up with a considered decision 
that about how effective the death penalty is. And you know, our, our view is that he will decide rightly that the death penalty really has no place in Indonesia's uh, penal code. And I would add one other thing. Um, we find it hypocritical in the extreme that Indonesia is uh, executing drug traffickers, six uh, already and another seven, I believe, are coming up for execution in the coming weeks, uh, while simultaneously seeking to uh, get clemency for Indonesian citizens who are on death row in foreign countries. Um, you know, this is hypocritical in the extreme. Uh, nobody should be receiving the death penalty, and the government should be absolutely fair and uh, and balanced in terms of how it uh, approaches the death penalty. Thank you. Yeah, um, Peter Alford from the Australian. Within the context of the 10-year deterioration, a general deterioration in human rights here that you mentioned, um, how does the large the resumption of large-scale executions rate? What effect does it have on the general human rights climate here? I would say that the resumption of uh, of executions in Indonesia in so early in the administration of President Joko Widodo sends a very worrying signal about uh, how this administration uh, is going to approach the issue of human rights and to what extent human rights are a priority. Uh, like we say, we saw a deterioration in human rights environment under the previous president. And we had and, and continue to have high hopes that President Widodo is going to turn the page and uh, make human rights a, a greater priority and to address issues such as religious intolerance, uh, the uh, security forces impunity in Papua, uh, the erosion of women's rights. And so in the first 100 days to make the death penalty an apparent priority for the government is extremely worrying and it's, at the very least, it's a misplaced emphasis in terms of government policy and resources. Uh, Nick Perry, Agence France Press. Um, Andrea Sosano, do you believe there is uh, an appetite for abolishing the death penalty in Indonesia? Um, obviously, there's been quite a lot of international pressure on the government in the wake of the most recent executions. But do you believe it's an issue that uh, ordinary Indonesians perhaps support President Widodo on? Or do you feel that it's an issue that perhaps he can... Uh, look decisive and, and gain political support for taking a tough stance on this issue? There, there is no recent survey on the public perceptions of death penalty. Although if I take a look at the media in Indonesia, I would like to say yes, there is a public support for death penalty. Uh, especially against three issues. One is for drugs, and the second is for uh, corruptions, and the third for terrorism. In fact, Indonesia most famous, uh, arguably most famous uh, singer, ballad, rock star, uh, Ivan Fales, just uh, going to write a song about that penalty for corruptions. This is like the Indonesian equivalent of Bob Dylan. You, you can imagine if someone like, like Ivan Fales is going to release his song on that penalty. Or else if you tune in, watch TV, Indonesian mainstream TV station, uh, the, the headlines are war on drugs everywhere from morning the, to the evening news, war on drugs. So I'm afraid that the public opinion is being shaped by this, this so-called slogan, war on drugs. Uh, they are also repeated, repeated the president statement that every day between 40 until uh, and 50 people, mostly teenagers, youngsters, die because of drugs consumption. So the the public sentiment is shaping into that particular area. I would just add that uh, you know, governance and good governance uh, isn't something that is based on opinion polls or public support for certain issues. Um, good governance is based on 
an assessment of the facts and what's doing what's best for your country uh, based on both domestic and international considerations, and most importantly, based on best practices and on international law. And with that regard, the uh, government's move toward back toward the death penalty uh, is a mistake, and it's something that the government really should rethink. Good morning. Uh, my question is to both of you. Uh, Philip, thanks for your assessment. Uh, I want to raise the question of 1965. You mentioned that uh, more or less this taboo on 1965 is over. It's becoming more public now, and people can openly discuss it. Uh, of course, there's no such thing as that impunity has been lifted on this issue. Uh, my question is, what are the steps Human Rights Watch are, will be doing in this coming year on this issue? Thank you. So with regards to 1965 and 1966, what Human Rights Watch has done already is to call on both the Indonesian government and the government of the United States to uh, open their files and to uh, provide information in terms of, uh, from their, their military data databases, in terms of what exactly happened, uh, who made the orders, uh, and what were the impacts on, on the Indonesian population. Uh, this is, I, I will be honest with you, this is very early days with regard to this type of advocacy. This is a huge issue. Um, this is an issue that has a, a, a huge importance and significance for the Indonesian people. So any steps toward uh, clarity and transparency and justice in this regard uh, is going to require the focused energies of the government and other governments that might be able to shed light on exactly what happened in 65, 66 and why it happened. And so I can tell you that Human Rights Watch, it, it, from our perspective and from what we can do, will be continuing to raise this issue with the Indonesian government and with uh, Indonesia's key bilateral allies as uh, an issue which uh, Indonesia needs to address in order to uh, help to eradicate this legacy of impunity which still continues to leach into uh, the present day with regards to how the security forces operate in many parts of Indonesia, but particularly Papua. So we see this as a historical issue, historical justice, but which can have profound implications for how, uh, how justice is rendered today. I hope that answers your question, Mr. Lim. Uh, more questions? Yep. When, when you ask your question, could you please identify yourself and your, uh, your, so, your agency? Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, Andreas, and uh, thank you for the speaker. I'm sorry to be late. I, I take note of the, the previous question by uh, the gentleman on, on the 65 uh, events. Uh, you may note that uh, this particular matter is now being, being listed in, uh, in a way with a host of uh, six other issues as far as the Human Rights, concern, uh, Human Rights uh, Commission is concerned in, in Indonesia. And therefore, <clears throat> it in a way uh, reduces the, the, the scale of the issue uh, to uh, one of uh, a series of uh, past human rights violations. Whereas, uh, if I understand you well, uh, the the 65 events uh, can be seen as, uh, should be seen as, uh, as a big bang uh, uh, issue that, uh, that uh, has, uh, or could be seen as, as a primary source of uh, subsequent uh, human rights violations in the, in the country. And therefore, it has great significance, as you say, uh, having this being addressed uh, in, 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 in due time and in a, in a much more systematic way than it has been in the past. We've had some, some uh, developments uh, uh, with regard to this in the, uh, in the pe immediate past period uh, with uh, these uh, uh, what is this, uh, short films that are being, being uh, uh, shown around the country and, and uh, abroad. 
uh, I think it has a, it, it had a great impact on, on uh, the awareness of this uh, matter, but it, it, needs to be, it needs to be brought up in a way that becomes a, a real issue for, uh, for the government. Uh, now, uh, I did just pick up uh, a few points from, from your presentation on, on, uh, on the death penalty and uh, relating this to, to the President's uh, take on things. Uh, I would perhaps uh, suggest that, that uh, the, the issue of death penalty should be placed in a much more contextual and, uh, and perhaps more substantive uh, uh, approach in that a moratorium uh, in so far as uh, international law best practices is concerned, are concerned, uh, a moratorium on a fundamental right, uh, in this case uh, a death penalty, constitutes an abolishment of death penalty. And therefore, it, it is not just a resumption of a policy. It should be pointed out that, that uh, by having a, a moratorium of sorts in place for the past few years, uh, in fact means that Indonesia has effectively abolished that, while although it's still in the law. And therefore, uh, from an international law perspective, it needs to be pointed out to the Indonesian government that uh, this, is the, uh, this is precisely the case, and that uh, this is not only uh, a humanitarian issue, but it's, it's a fundamental international law issue whereby a moratorium constitutes, in, in effect, an abolishment of the death penalty. Thank you for your views, sir. Do you have a question? We have a lot of people here. Yes. Yeah. Do you have a question? My question is, while this is all useful, in what way can your observations be helpful? Because if, it, if it's uh, divorced from the contextual situation in Indonesia, why has the uh, present government all of a sudden come up with uh, a decision on, on, an, on uh, executing, on implementing the death penalty? That has, that has not, in, in fact, uh, quite uh, come out in, 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 the, in the explanation because, the, because of the state of the law enforcement agencies, the Attorney General's office has had to come out asserting itself in some way and the only persuasive way and convincing way to, to do that is to go back to a, a very severe approach to a law and that is to implement the death penalty. Sir, therefore, sir I, I'm sorry to interrupt. Uh, your, your observations are fascinating and I would be happy to continue this conversation Face to face. Well, well my question is. So, but if you could just cut to your question, because we have a lot yeah, of people well, here. Well, my question is: In what way can all these observations from the Human Rights Watch be helpful? It, it is all observations. I, I, I concede these are very, very helpful observations. But we in Indonesia, we need helpful solutions, not just observations. We can come up with all these observations. Thank you very much, yeah. sir. I'll just okay. interrupt. I'll just interrupt. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Actually, thank you very much. Sir, we are an international human rights organization. So, you know, we don't come with solutions. We do research, we make recommendations, and then it, it is the prerogative of the sovereign government of the Republic of Indonesia to do what's right. We tell them what their obligations are under domestic law and under international law, and then we leave it to them. That is our role as an international advocacy organization. So thank you. I hope that sort of clarifies your question. What extent do you think that defendants in criminal cases can receive a fair trial in this country? And do you think that torture is common in, uh, in police investigations? Thank you. According to CONTRAS, Human Rights Organization, uh, police often uh, does torture in Indonesia. And the internal police mechanism is not adequate to address abuses by the police in the detention center. Uh, I don't remember exactly the figure, but Contras did counting the statistic year after year about how many cases of torture that they found out based on 
uh, observing the media, media clippings. But in contrast, has been repeatedly called on the national police to deal with this, uh, to strengthen the internal branch of the police, uh, also to strengthen the national commissions on police, Com Compolnas. Uh, and so far, the government has not done enough to help uh, reform the police. In fact, over the last 10 years, there are six steps uh, initiated by the government 10 years ago, uh, 11 years ago to be precise, after the 2002 police law to reform the police, uh, starting from dealing with abuses by the police, uh, sorry, starting by cleaning up the police recruitment mechanism, cleaning up the bribery when one is going to enter the police academy or when one would like to be promoted with the police. Uh, the current crisis, KPK crisis, is devastating because people who try to work within the system are devastated to know that uh, what they have been trying to do. For instance, in 2008, uh, an insider told me that they have managed to make the recruitment the selections of the police academy in Semarang to be totally clean, no, you know, no briberies. But then it written again in 2009, 2010, etc. Torture is also so. It is a problematic problem. In it is a problematic issue within the national police. It should be deal. Unfortunately, by doing this death penalty, President Jokowi does not does not address the complicated, difficult, challenging issue of legal reform in Indonesia. He chooses to do something which is quick, what he calls shock therapy, by executing uh, six, six people on, on, on drug street. Uh, that is so wrong. Hi, I'm Eva from the Jakarta Globe. Um, in the film, the, the Look of Silence, there's a moment where the teacher is, um, a school teacher is teaching a classroom of students about the 1965 killings, and it's a very selective history. Um, to what extent do you see within the curriculum a sort of selective vision of historical events, and is this something the government should be addressing? Um, and also, what could the government be doing within it, the education system to um, to address or raise awareness about human rights generally? Uh, a few years ago, Eva, there was an effort by the Ministry of Education to use the acronym G30S, stand for Gerakan 30 September, the ter September 30th movement, not the previously used G30S slash PKI, Partai Komunis Indonesia. There was a storm of criticism against the Ministry of Education for only deleting that particular word. Why did they use only G30S? Because that was the name that was used by a number of young officers who kidnapped seven general back in 1965. Without the slash PKI, which implicate that it was the Indonesian Communist Party which did the kidnapping and later the killing. Uh, because of the controversy, because of the criticism, the Minister of Education returned to the old naming, which is 330S slash PKI. So that is only one example about how difficult it is to deal uh, with 1965, which is the mother of all violence in Indonesia. Uh, in April last year, I happened to talk with with Muhammad Yamin, the head of SECNAS Jokowi, National Secretariat of Jokowi, who is basically Jokowi's main campaign team. And I asked him, what is your biggest, what is your most difficult issue that you are going to address, uh, Jokowi is going to address in terms of human rights? His answer was pretty short, 1965. Wow, that is a tall order, but you know, uh, it is not easy. Uh, now we have a reform-minded Minister of Education. Uh, his name is Anis Baswedan, uh, who is trying to, to do the right things uh, back uh, about, you know, including history lesson in Indonesia. Let's hope that he's going to manage. I'm going to meet him in the next two weeks, talking about uh, national curriculum, talking about educational reform. 
Um, hi, my name's Annalise and I'm from the Jakarta Post. Um, just following up on your calls for clarity and justice regarding the 1965-1966 killings, um, I was just wondering if you see a time in Indonesia's future where the perpetrators of these killings will be held responsible, um, often who still hold positions of power in Indonesia. What's essential with regards to how the Indonesian government handles uh, the accountability for 1965-66? Uh, is accountability in, in all senses of the word. And that is first starting with a complete accounting of, of what happened, uh, who gave the orders, who carried them out, uh, who was killed, where they're buried. Uh, so, you know, these are, are very thorny, complex issues um, that the Indonesian government is going to have to parse uh, on its own. Um, but you know, from our perspective and, you know, from the perspective of international law, you know, full accountability means full, account full accountability. Thank you. Hi, I'm Nofri from the British Embassy Jakarta. I just want to ask a quick question. Uh, Phelim, you mentioned that one of the three issues um, that Jokowi, Jokowi inherited is the ongoing erosion of women's rights. Yeah. And my question is in terms of the FGM, female uh, genital mutilation. What is the Human Rights Watch views on that? As we are aware that the FGM issue is one of the key recommendations made by the Human Rights Committee in Geneva for Indonesia. And how do you see the practice here in Indonesia? Is it one of the things that Human Rights Watch is concerned about or would like to see your view on that? Thanks. Initially, the Ministry of Health banned FGM in Indonesia. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, in 2006. But there was a protest from the, some uh, Muslim organization, including the Indonesian Ulama Council. But then because of the protest, the Ministry of Health issue, renew the regulation by saying that the practice is permitted, but they want to have some kind of regulation. Human rights was opposed. Uh, any pricking of female uh, clitoris because it will uh, affect their reproductive health, their urinary system. It will impact the health of, of, the, of the girl whose clitoris were mutilated. So we are calling on the new government to stop that practice, to ban that practice. I learned that Last week, there was a mass circumcision of girls in Bandung. More than 100 girls were cir circumcised. You can read the story at Suara Pembarua newspaper. So that is our stance, that we call on the government, the, the Minister of Health, to stop that practice once again. We also ask the Minister of Health to stop virginity tests, because this virginity test has been over, over and again uh, stop and then on again, uh, stop, on again. Why? Because if it was stopped, let's say, in the police, the police used to stop it in the year of 2000, but the TNI still d did that until now. And I know the practice just was 3-5 again. Or at the uh, STPDN, the School of the Ministry of Home Affairs for Civil Servant. Uh, at one point, it was stopped, the practice was stopped, there was no more virginity testing. But then it was revived again. We do not know how it happened, but the practice happened again. Of course, it is based on a myth that a virgin, when she is doing her first uh, sexual intercourse, will bleed. That is, that is the myth, which is being uh, believed and, and recycled over and over again in many, many Indonesian books or stories or movie or magazine, and many other media outlets. Uh, we are now calling on the president to stop it. This is not a rocket science. This is not difficult. This is not shaping a new policy. We just call on President Jokowi to issue a letter saying no more virginity tests. Because in the past, it was not successful. Education, military, police, Ministry of Home Affairs, Ministry of uh, uh, the Department of Custom, and prison official, recruitment of new female prison official, they were also tested. 
So that, that kind of things uh, regarding on women's rights. Uh, Josh Dyer from the Jakarta Post. Um, just specifically, again, in relation to the death penalty, um, to what extent does corruption within the police and judiciary system affect um, how many people um, either get let off or don't get let off <coughs> with regards to corruption? We do not know for sure to what extent corruption do play a role. But of course, there are questions uh, from, for instance, from Human Rights Working Group, uh, a lawyer from Human Rights Working Group, who questions why the list of death row convicts in December, uh, six people, uh, suddenly changed uh, of those who were finally executed uh, three, two weeks ago. Why there is such a change? Why the initial list had more Indonesian and only one foreigner? And then the final uh, lineup was five foreigners and one Indonesian. Why there is such a change? Uh, the Attorney General Office never answered that question. There should be questions. You should raise that kind of questions to the Attorney General Office. You have to raise that question to the National Police. What are, you know, what are the criteria to put of all these more than 100 people, uh, sorry, uh, 70 something people, 74, <laughs> Uh, what are the decisions, what are the criteria to put six on the front row, maybe another seven or six on the second lineup, and then the third lineup? What are the criteria? It is not clear. How many Indonesian drug criminals are on death row, and how many of, how many of them have had clemency refused? I don't know. I there, don't have the figure right now. There was something in, I think, the Jakarta Post last mm. week that suggested there were 34 out of about 60 uh, foreign drug criminals? I, I don't know. Uh, mm. I have to check. The okay. data is available. Uh, Are you publicly. able to check on that? Yes, but not now. Okay, yeah, thank you. My name is Aditya from Canadian Embassy. Uh, do you have recommendation on how to process uh, past human rights cases? I mean, uh, through judicial process or reconciliation? Thanks for your question. I assume that you're referring to either 65, 66, or post ni or 98. Uh, they're all. Your question is applicable to any of those dates and the uh, the murders and disappearances that occurred. Um, I would say that there is very good uh, examples of how societies have dealt with mass atrocities, mass historical atrocities. That there are multiple countries which have grappled with this issue uh, in different ways uh, in terms of bringing about accountability, uh, redress, and compensation for the victims and their families. So our advice is that the government needs to take a look at those best practices of countries that have dealt with these types of issues in the past, not repeat the mistakes that some states have made uh, in order to find you know, a, a, a path that allows Indonesia to come to terms with these past atrocities in a way that does justice to the victims, uh, provides compensation, and most importantly, this is the probably the most important thing, ensure that these types of things don't happen again. That whatever mechanisms, whatever failures, whatever types of impunity uh, allowed these things to happen cannot recur. I hope that answers your question. Uh, Kenny from the Jakarta Group. Uh, so there are a long list of human rights problems that should be looked at by the government in the coming years. Um, which one do you think uh, should be prioritized first? Which one do you think should be prioritized first? Um, do you think that the government, do you think that Joko is able to uh, address all those problems given the fact that uh, his administration started by making mistakes? Uh, I'll start with this answer and I'll pass it on to Pak Andreas. I, I would say there are, there are some issues that the government can address today that are, do not require a lot of heavy lifting. And I'll just go back to what Pak Andreas said. This afternoon, President Wododo can sign a letter to the TNI and to the police saying, 
immediately stop virginity tests. You can hold a press conference and say, we have ordered an end to this violence against women. It's not gonna happen anymore. So it, that should be a priority because you know it doesn't require calling together parliament. It doesn't require coalition building. It just requires the political will and the decision to get up and say, we will no longer abuse our women in this way. So that's something that is a priority because it's a short-term priority and it isn't a heavy lift. Um, in terms of other issues, you know, we have flagged, uh, prioritized the issue of uh, religious uh, related violence and intimidation and harassment. And this remains a, a crucial key issue in Indonesia. And something that the government can do in the short term is just arrest the people who do it. But one of the reasons why uh, religious-related violence happens so often in Indonesia is that people get away with it, that they don't get arrested. Very often, police are passively or actively complicit with them. So again, this is something that the government doesn't need to invent a law, it just needs to enforce the laws. Um, so I would say th those are, are two you know, quick priorities that the government uh, can actually do in the short term. But I will pass this on to Pak pa Andreas for his ideas. Actually, we sent a letter to President Jokowi. It's on our website, you can read it, in which we list a number of short-term solution or, and also long-term solution. Uh, Philip mentions about virginity tests. President Jokowi can easily sign a letter saying no. No policy, just saying no. No more virginity tests. It is banned by the World Health Organization. And of all big countries in the world whose population is more than 10 million, 15 million people, more than 15 million people, there is only one country in this world whose state institution do virginity tests. That country is Indonesia. That country is Indonesia. Uh, here we mention about Papua. Here we mention about religious freedom. Here we mention about women's rights, the more complicated issue on women's rights, for instance. Uh, I would like to mention uh, two issues. One is religious freedom. This is, some are easy to, to solve, like anyone who do violence in the name of any religion whether it is Islam in the western part of Indonesia or whether it is Christianity in the eastern part of Indonesia because, you know, in Kupang, in Timor, uh, people also do violence in the name of uh, Christianity. Uh, anyone who do violence should be arrested. Anyone who do violence in the name of their religion should be tried and should be punished accordingly, okay? But there is more complicated issue. What is it? Over the last 10 years, President Yudhoyono institutionalized a concept that he called religious harmony. Religious harmony, not religious freedom, which is in the Constitution. What is religious harmony? Religious harmony concept based on a belief that, on a, on a text, that the majority should protect the minority. Meanwhile, the minority should respect the majority. Protect and respect. That is his main concept, religious harmony. So because based on that religious, based on that religious harmony context, uh, concept, President Yudhoyono uh, in 2006, for instance, wrote a regulation setting up the so-called Religious Harmony Forum all over Indonesia as advisory body. 17 members on the regency and city level, and 21 members on the provincial level. So their duties are to advise, quote unquote, advise uh, regions, uh, mayors, uh, governors. And their membership, their proportion, should be proportional with the proportion of each province or each regency religious uh, population. So, you know, if in Jakarta, let's say, I don't know, how many percents are Muslim? the number of, the percentage of Muslim in that particular forum should represent the percentage as well. Or in Bali, the majority are Hindus, of course, the majority of that forum members should be Hindus. Uh, also in 2006, President Yudhoyono established a regulation on building houses of worship, which 
make it extremely difficult for minorities to build and later also to, re to renovate their houses of worship. That's why now about over the last 10 years under President Giordano, uh, more than 600 churches were closed down. And you don't know, in his New York speech, if you carefully read his speech, uh, saying that Indonesia Muslim is about 88%, but the mosque is, the number of mosques is only 70, 75, 76% of the total houses of worship. Meanwhile, Christian, uh, the total population is only about 10%, nearly 10%. Meanwhile, the number of churches among the Christian is 18%. As if trying to say that, look, uh, we are quite, quite harmonious, we are quite tolerating. It is based on that concept. And also based on that majority minority concept, there is no blasphemy law. There should, uh, sorry, there should be no blasphemy. If one is committing blasphemy, one has to be punished. That's why in 2009, when Abdurrahman Wahid challenged the blasphemy law, Yudhoyono defended the blasphemy law. Uh, in 2008, he also passed the anti akmadi decree. So that issue is difficult to be undone. That issue is difficult to be undone because over the last 10 years, you don't know has institutionalized this kind of sectarianism basically because under Indonesia constitution, every citizen has equal rights. Equality is there. There is no such thing as majority minority under Indonesian law. But you don't know, make it as a part of the, the law. I talked to President Jokowi and he asked me about what is the problem over dinner. And I told him that over the last 10 years, the concept was shifted by his predecessor by introducing these majority minority considerations in religious affairs. And he realized, and I think Jokowi realized that it is difficult. He banged the door. <coughs> How could it that be? That is difficult. We have Pa Atma Kusuma Astra Atmaja here, the former chairman of of the press council who cares so much about Papua, I would like to mention about Papua things. There are many international journalists in this room. You know how difficult it is to get a permit to go to Papua. What is the process? If you want to go to Papua, you need to go to Kemlu, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and apply for a permit. And your application should be approved by a clearinghouse who meet every week, every Wednesday, at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, 18 institutions. If one of them disagree with your application, if one of them Google your name and feel like, you know, this guy is a little bit dubious, this journalist is a little bit uh, problematic, you will not get the permit. You will not get the permit. And how old is this? I check into your own organization record, the Jakarta Foreign Correspondent Club, Cathy. In 1969, the Jakarta Foreign Correspondent Club protested. 1969, protest this regulation. What year are we now? What year are we now? 2015. And that regulation is still on the book. That is against Paatma. That is against Indonesia's own press law, 1999. 1999, because according to the press law that Paatma used to write, uh, helped to write, uh, the government can restrict media access to any regency or any province in Indonesia because of security issue, serious security issue, and it should be approved by the parliament, plus it should be in a limited time frame. 50 years is not a limited time frame. Uh, my name is King. I'm from an Indonesian LGBT organization. My, uh, as you may know, uh, the go Indonesian government has refused so far to acknowledge LGBT as minority. Yeah. They argue always that it's a morality issue and that they cannot uh, go ahead on the pervasive homophobia that is still occurring in the public, general public. So. So, but that, that attitude has, has also allowed to a lot of uh, local bylaws and even laws, yeah, to, to be incrementally be imposed, yeah, that not only discriminates against LGBT, but also semi-criminalize them. So, my question is, what, what steps would you suggest to the Indonesian government to undertake 
and to turn around this kind of policies. Thank you. Thank you very much for your question. Um, the, the issue of LGBT rights in Indonesia and the sort of tapestry of local regulations and bylaws uh, that uh, discriminate against them is what we consider another example of how uh, you know, the Indonesian government and its regulations are kind of are, are on the wrong side of history. Um, we we see uh, violations of LGBT rights, uh, harassment, intimidation of, of LGBT populations as something of a of a problem globally, um, and Indonesia is part of that whole global problem. And this is. Uh, something that we are engaging with the Indonesian government on, uh, and it's something that we hope that they will uh, seek to address. And in the short term, our, our key uh, advocacy point is ensuring that uh, LGBT populations in Aceh are not subjected to brutal uh, Sharia law punishments, such as 100 lashes for same-sex relations. So that's the starting point, protecting people from violence and going from there. But uh, again, this is a, this is a long-term uh, battle, but one that, uh, again, the Indonesian government is currently on the wrong side of history, but I, I'd say that it, we're optimistic this is gonna change. Thank you.